Okay, so I have a feeling that a lot of the women in this room have are your customers, have been your customers. So maybe, actually, let's take a quick survey. Who here has done SoulCycle? Okay, all right, so a lot, a lot. <laughs> let's start with that question. Who is your customer? Who is your core demographic? Who are you targeting? You know, when the, the business started 10 years ago, the mission was really simple. It was to make fitness joyful and fitness fun. We had two co-founders that met in New York, and they couldn't find a place where they could go and work out and connect with other people and find an experience that was social and joyful the way that hiking outside was in Los Angeles or other types of yoga or, or spinning were 10 years ago. Um, so they came together and decided that they should create the experience that they couldn't find and created SoulCycle, which at its heart is really about fun. You know, we create experiences where you ride 45 minutes in the dark to candlelight and the experience is physical and it's emotional and it's musical and it gives people a way to connect. And what happens with that is we have teenagers who ride with us, we have sold out teen classes at 4.30 every afternoon, and we have 80 year olds that ride with us. And it's really a very wide, more of a psychographic that we attract than it is a demographic than anything, which is really exciting for us because we think we've got a really long growth runway for the business ahead of us. So are there limitations on how far you can take the brand, right? So right now, pretty coastal, um, luxury product for some people, where can you go? Where can you not go? I mean, it's hard. We say we're in the business of personal transformation. What we do is we give people the space to disconnect from technology. When is, you guys have time in your week where you actually put your phone away for 45 minutes and invest in yourself and really reflect on who you are and who you want to be. We have our instructors we treat as inspirational coaches, and it's their job to motivate the group and to really challenge you to think differently about yourself, push yourself through limits that you didn't know possible. And the energy of the pack pushes you harder than you even knew that you could. And so when you think about the business in terms of personal transformation, the bike today is really just the vessel. And we believe we've got an opportunity to extend the brand into new categories and new experiences that can continue to deliver this idea of personal transformation, but may not be tethered to the studio. Can you give a couple examples of what that might look like? Well, right now, uh, we're very focused on our core business growth. You know, we're opening between 10 and 15 studios a year, and we think we've got a ton of opportunity domestically to keep bringing soul to the people, which is our mission. Um, next year, we're going to open our first international market in Toronto, which we're really excited about, and we're taking a lot of care to make sure that we do that in the right way. Um, we're scaling a live experience business. We've treated this from the beginning as a curtains up, curtains down live production business. Um, every hour on the hour, we are running this live production, and we want to make sure that we do that with integrity and authenticity, and it's a very community-based experience. And so what we really are focused on right now is, is core business. Okay. So if you think last year, you guys filed for an IPO. Any updates on that? Any What's happening there? Or is this likely to happen next year by the unlikely end of this year? What's, what can you tell us? You know, right now we're in a holding pattern based on market conditions and we are continuing right now to invest in our infrastructure and, and really focused on our core business growth. So no update right now. Does the political environment change anything for you? You know, what the political environment has changed for us in the last couple of weeks um, has really been the importance, I think, of our role in our local communities. Um, what we saw the day after the election is that people were very emotional in our communities. And I think when you know, change creates uncertainty and it creates a lot of worry regardless of your political view. And we found that SoulCycle was a place that people could come and really disconnect and come together with their communities. We had some of the busiest days in the history of the company in those four days after the election um, because people were really looking for a place to come and, again, put their phones down, um, disconnect, and sort of feel what they needed to feel in a dark room. Uh, one of our instructors <laughs> on, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan um, turned all the lights off, and, and the, it was the week where Leonard Cohen died as well. And she played the song Hallelujah and turned out all the lights and said, put on as much resistance as you can, and we're going to climb all together. And what happened in the room was one of our riders was so moved by the experience that he actually got off of his bike and walked bike to bike hugging people in the room. Yeah. And what that shows is that people really do need a place to connect, and they need a place to heal, and they need a place to cry, and it's safe at SoulCycle. It is in the dark, and it is with other people, and you are having this musical and physical and emotional experience. And so I think it just makes our role that much more important and the mission that much greater and more exciting that uh, we want to bring this experience to more communities you know, globally. 
So how do you do that? Have you thought about tweaking the model? I mean, could you change the pricing structure in some way? You know, right now what we've seen is we can't satisfy demand for the product. And so as we've gone into more markets, non-coastal markets, it was probably the biggest question that we faced as we were preparing for the IPO. Is this going to work outside of New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco? And as we've opened in Chicago and Miami and Dallas and Houston and Austin and Philadelphia and Seattle in the next couple of weeks, uh, we haven't really faced any price resistance because people really value what you pay for. And what we create is this three-dimensional experience. It's physical, it's emotional, and it's musical. And it's tethered to this community of like-minded individuals. Um, and what we've seen is with this sort of macro economy, as people are shifting away from traditional retail, they're really looking for experiences and placing a value on experiences, especially those that are meaningful to them individually. Um, so right now, again, we're really focused on just keeping the model going and making sure that we're investing in the talent to scale. So how do you make sure that you don't become a fad, right? We've seen a lot of exercise trends over the years. How do you make yeah. sure that you stay relevant? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so spinning as a workout has been around for 30 years, over 30 years. I don't, I don't know if most people know that. But the great thing about um, spinning is that it's an entirely democratic workout. There's only a couple of ways to get cardio, and indoor cycling is one of them. The workout is entirely customizable through the resistance knob and through choice of hand weights. And a lot of people just come and sit in the back row and gently pedal in the room because they just want to be having this physical experience. And so as a workout, it's definitely not a fad, but we've taken it to a whole other level. Internally, we talk about SoulCycle as a hospitality business. It's our responsibility to get to know our riders, one rider at a time, and to create these meaningful connections with them. Uh, we treat our studio managers as entrepreneurs in their local communities, and they're empowered to make the right decisions for our riders in those moments and to get to know them as individuals. Um, the top of our core values, which we have 10 of, is that we are a culture of yes. We believe there is a yes in every interaction with a rider, with each other. We want to make sure that we're always finding yes. So we might not be able to get you in for the 6 a.m. class tomorrow morning, but we're going to get you in for the 7 a.m. Or we're going to prioritize you tomorrow at 6 a.m. Or we're going to pre-book you. Or I'm going to get you a piece of retail. I'm going to do anything to make sure that you have an incredible experience with us. And I think because of that connection, again, in a world where we're so connected with devices and we're so disconnected from each other, it's a place where you can go where someone knows your name and knows not just the size of shoe you wear and the temperature you like your water, but what bike you want to be on. If I haven't seen you in a week, I'm going to ask you where you were. And the sense of community and hospitality, I think, is what's going to keep us away from the, the fad challenge. So what, I'm actually going to open it up to questions in a second, but first I want to ask, what are the broader trends that you're seeing in society that you think are driving your business? What's happening there? You know, I think it's a, it's a couple of things. I think, first of all, health is the new wealth, and you, you sort of you read this everywhere. You know, um, consumers are really focused on healthy living across all categories, and there's no doubt that that has been a great tailwind for us as we've grown the business over the last 10 years. Um, secondly, as retail, as I said, is waning, and we've seen the rise of the experiential economy, um, there's no doubt that consumers are looking for experiences, and they're willing to pay a premium for them, and so that, that has been great for us as well. Um, and the last thing that we've really seen is that the urbanization of the population globally is bringing people back into city centers. You know, today a third of the world's population lives in urban markets, and by 2050, I think a half of the world's population is going to live in urban markets. And what that creates is this great opportunity, obviously, as the population starts to center, but also a great opportunity for community product to rise, right? You've got all these people moving, and my sister lives in, in Seattle, and I spend a lot of time out there, and every time I'm there, there's like six new high-rises in that, in that market. And I just think, oh my gosh, I can't wait to bring SoulCycle to you, because then you'll actually have a place to meet each other, and to get to know each other, and to spend time in our our lobbies together. Um, so I think it's the combination of those three things um, that have really helped us and, and fueled our growth. Great. Do we have any questions for Melanie? Any questions? Any? Oh, back there. Melanie, I read an article recently about how you dealt with gender bias in, um, and being proactive about how uh, a woman can be perceived when making a pitch or pushing for something, and how you um, said to them at the beginning of the meeting, you're probably going to have some gender bias about me because I'm going to push you. <laughs> you, know, you said something to that effect. I'd love to hear more about your thoughts about how you've become aware of those kinds of tendencies so that you could be a better leader and a better woman leader. Thanks. Um, 
You know, I think in that particular piece, I, I was talking about uh, the acquisition of SoulCycle, which is something that I worked on back in 2011 when I was at Equinox. Um, and I think that the couple of things I learned from that experience that I really try to coach our teams on a lot um, is first of all, the, the power of the facts. Just really know your facts, stick to your facts, and make your arguments really objective rather than subjective and about emotion. Um, and that definitely helped as we were um, packaging that investment was to really say, here are the fundamentals of the business, here's where the industry is going, here's why I think this could work, and, and that was a, a huge part of it. Um, and then secondly, just the importance of relationships. You know, I found in that instance in particular, um, and also you know, in any sort of big project that we're working on across the organization, and when we're scaling, we're probably small compared to a lot of businesses and the powerful leaders that are in this room, but um, to have 66 locations and to roll something out takes a lot of work, and so to sell that through to our operators, just make sure that you're developing the relationships when the stakes aren't high, so that when the stakes are high or you need something, you've got that goodwill in the bank. Um, and the last thing I always say is I think the wonderful thing about being a female leader, at least for me in particular, and the teams that we've built at SoulCycle, we're so passionate about what we do. We get behind everything in such a big way. And if you start with the facts, and then you've got the relationships, when you bring passion, that's sort of the magical, the magical combination. You know, I talk a lot about this. One of the things I'm most proud of is that 86% of our studio leaders are female. And you know, I think there's a lot of dialogue around gender bias and uh, fair wages. And you know, I'm really proud of what we are doing within our environment to promote women, to develop women, to invest in women. And these are women who may have started on our front desk as a part-time job to, to complement something else that they were doing. And they're now running multi-million dollar businesses. And we have trained these entrepreneurs on how to write a budget, you know, how to build a marketing plan, but also how to give feedback and how to receive feedback gracefully, how to capitalize on your strengths and not focus on your failures. Uh, we have over 100 proprietary training programs that we've created for our entrepreneurs, male or female alike, but when 86% of them are women, it's so exciting to think about what, we're, what we are creating and what we're putting out in the world. So, Great, any other questions? We have one in the front right here. Oh, sorry, yeah, right in the front. Hi. How do you drive the culture of yes? I mean, it sounds like you have a lot of locations. You have a lot of employees that are working for you. Is it how you pick your talent? Is it how you're training them? How do you reinforce this? Because, I mean, what you're describing is excellent customer service. Um, and, uh, you know, I work in a corporation. I work for Advanced Auto Parts. We have 5,000 stores, 75,000 employees. And it's hard, you know, when you have an idea of what you want the culture to be. How do you drive that? locally, because it seems like you guys are doing that quite well. Thank you. It's a lot of work. Um, I think the, the, the obvious and the easy answers are behavioral interviewing and hiring, knowing what your core values are, and then hiring against that. I always say we hire a lot more for attitude than, and, and aptitude than experience, and we're going to train you on everything that you need to know. Um, and then our training programs, you know, just continuing to instill this sort of way of being and how to find a yes and reinforcing that over and over again is really important to us. Um, but the thing that I think has been really key to our success is I think companies take core values and they write these really nice manifestos and they put them in the back of an employee handbook and they sit on your shelf. We bring them to life very actively. So one of the things that we did last year was uh, we created a core value pin program um, where on your year anniversary you're given a stock card that says Soul It Forward and it takes our 10 core values and there's an individually designed pin for each each value. And you're responsible for when you see someone finding the yes, embracing change, getting dirty, the things that are so core to us, you sole it forward and you acknowledge that behavior. And what happened is we created this hashtag around it and there's a big social campaign around it and we're seeing that studio managers and instructors and HQ employees are sending these pins across the country to people saying, wow, you really helped me with that. He got dirty, she embraced change. And so by living it and by seeing it on social, in the studios and celebrating it in town halls, in HQ meetings, on weekly emails that I do to the company, I think that's really how we've brought it to life. And ultimately it's only as powerful, I think, as the leadership embracing it and, and really driving it. That's a great way to end on that note, live your core values. So Melanie, thank you so thank much. Thank you.